Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our SETI Institute Hangout. I'm uh, Jill Tarter, and I hold the Bernard M. Oliver Chair for SETI here at the SETI Institute, and I'm the host and moderator for this Hangout. The goal today is to share with you, the public, and also with our SETI star fans, the excitement of the research in the field of astrobiology that involves our SETI Institute researchers. Today, we'll discuss the role of the SETI Institute in the, in the search for exolife, life outside of our planet, and the extreme life forms that we're discovering on our own planet that help us understand the potential for what might be out there. So let me start first by introducing our speakers for this Hangout. Dale Anderson is joining us from San Antonio, Texas. He's certainly the most extreme of my colleagues here at the SETI Institute. He's got a degree in physical geography from McGill University, and he spends his time diving below the ice-covered lakes in the Antarctic and the Arctic to study the ecosystems there. He also travels to extreme deserts and to the Siberian permafrost, tracking down life. Lori Fenton, who's on my left, uh, is a planetary scientist, and her main interest is how winds shape planetary surfaces, either here on Earth or now she's looking at Mars. She uses detailed climate model codes to interpret the data from observing platforms orbiting Mars and from Curiosity's ground truth data. Uh, on Lori's left is Cynthia Phillips, and she's also a planetary scientist with an interest in Mars, but her main passion is studying uh, the features of Jupiter's moon Europa to see how they're changing over time and what that means for the potential energy sources there that could possibly support some form of life beneath the icy crust of that moon. And our final participant is Frank Marchis. Now, many of you probably know Frank because he's usually the host and moderator of these hangouts. But today, he's speaking as a planetary scientist who's interested in asteroids and moons, as well as planets. He's been wondering how to detect potentially habitable moons in uh, exoplanetary systems. I'll let each of our uh, scientists introduce themselves more fully and spend maybe three minutes uh, summarizing what they're working on right now and what is the question that each of them is trying to answer. So let's start with you, Dale. Thanks, Jill. Well, I'm going to just uh, go ahead and start my screen share here, so let me know if it doesn't show up. Uh, but basically, I do. I look at life in extreme environments, and currently most of my research takes place in areas such as the Antarctic. Um, but let's look at extreme environments very quickly. Um, what are extreme environments? These are really places that have limited resources. Um, they're physiologically very stressful for the organisms that can be there. Um, and one of the reasons that we go to these places is that we want to look for genetic and metabolic diversity. Uh, so we want to see who's there and how they're doing it. And this is really important since the uh, search for life elsewhere is going to really require that we understand that range of environmental conditions here on Earth that life's able to exploit and what those tricks of the trade are that they use to exploit them. You know, how do they do that work there? There was a really good article some years ago in Nature uh, by Lynn Rothschild and uh, Rocco Man Mancinelli um, who also uh, put together a very good chart that kind of goes through the range of environmental parameters here on Earth that we know about uh, that life exploits and, and gives us a, a sense of, of that, that huge range going from very hot temperatures to very cold to radiation to, to desiccation, high salinity, um, extremes in pH such as um, highs and lows, and then of course uh, lows and highs of oxygen. Um, so what I do is I go to places in the Arctic and the Antarctic to try to find some of those locations. And indeed, in the Antarctic, we've got some ice-covered lakes that are currently ice-covered. They've got uh, ice on them all year round. The ice is anywhere from a few meters to upwards of six, seven meters thick. And we do find life in those lakes. Uh, most recently, I've been going to a place called Lake Untersea, which is in the mountains of Queen Maudlin. Uh, we actually tra traverse out to this site. This is a, an aerial of the uh, lake itself. 
and you can see that uh, there's a large glacier coming in off the left-hand side. There's a peninsula that enters the lake, and the rest of that ice that you see there is actually the lake itself. And this is how we get there. We go by some small trucks, some Toyota trucks with trailers, and then we also skidoo out there with uh, um, sleds to get our, our gear set up. Mm -hmm. And then we set up camp for basically two months. This is our laboratory. This is our living space. This is our diving locker. It's everything that we've got. And if we don't have it when we get there, it's too bad. We've forgotten it. Uh, so we really have to be prepared when we go out to these field sites to do that kind of work. Um, you can see the, the difficulties of getting into these lakes. Like I said, the ice covers are relatively thick. Uh, we do have to make a dive hole to get through to access the water and to get to the bottom. And then we actually have to prepare ourselves to do some um, pretty extreme diving, uh, technical diving beneath the ice, and carry instrumentation and samples uh, back and forth between the sites. So what are we looking for? Well, we discovered in 2008 at Lake Untersea one of the most phenomenal things that we've ever seen. And this is, if you went back in time three and a half billion years here on our own planet, uh, you would have seen a site very similar to this. These are what are called large conical stromatolites, these large uh, cone-like features. And these can get up to about 50 centimeters. You know, so they look like a lot of the traffic cones that you see on the side of highways. They're about that same scale. And they populate the bottom of this lake. And that's it. There's no other organisms in there. I mean, it's basically just all microbial organisms. Uh, this is the kind of list of species that we see there. Um, some cyanobacteria, basically, and other heterotrophic bacteria. Uh, but you can see that these cones are just absolutely stunning and beautiful. And again, if you look back into the fossil record, three and a half billion years, uh, this is what it would have looked like. Matter of fact, the uh, uh, silicified cones that you see on the lower right uh, were some that we visited in the Pilbara region in Western Australia two years ago to make this exact comparison. And there's a, just on the top of that, you can see this cut through of, of one of the, uh, um, the cones, and you can see that they're laminated. And over on the left hand side, you can see the bottom of the lake, a uh, picture that I took of, of Lake Untersea at the bottom. And it's, it's a very, very similar environment morphologically. So it's a stunning place uh, to get to know. Uh, so that's what draws me to these places. You know, how do we understand how life can exploit these environments and how can we take those lessons uh, beyond the planet and start looking for environments that may have been able to host things on, say, the planet Mars under similar ice-covered lake conditions. Uh, even when Mars was at its warmest points in time, it may have been a very, very uh, cool place. And I think I'll stop there. Yeah, and, uh, Dale, you're, you're in fact my extreme colleague, and that's pretty extreme life that you're showing there. But let's go on to some of our other um, scientists and come back to you with questions from the audience. And thanks for showing us those amazing pictures. So, um, Lori, do you want to begin? Sure. Well, the next place to look for life beyond Earth, which is where Dale started, is Mars. That's the next planet out from Earth in the solar system. I guess it's the, the nearest place that we can really think of as a place where life might have begun. And we still don't know if life ever formed on Mars. We're still looking. Uh, I get that question a lot. Have we found life on Mars? We've found it, right? No, no, we haven't yet. We're still looking. But Mars has captured our attention, our interests, scientifically for about half a century. And I think um, science fiction-wise, at least a century now, but more than a century. Um, in terms of looking for life. And every time we go to Mars, we send a new mission to Mars and we get a little bit closer to finding something, something tantalizing that tells us that, yeah, life might have existed here. And it's really interesting that we're having this hangout today because three days ago, three days ago, uh, there was a press conference from uh, the Mars Science Lander, Curiosity. Yes. Scientifically, for about half a century, and I think yeah, we're going to get Thank you, Frank, for the uh, commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to the real Lori All right, so there was a press conference on Tuesday, the March 12th, where um, th there was a big announcement from the Curiosity rover team that they found conditions that were suitable for life that occurred on Mars billions of years ago. Um, every time we go to Mars, we get a little bit better at sending the right instruments and picking the right place to look on Mars, to look for an environment where life might have formed and possibly flourished. And I, I watched the press conference again last night, and. Um, they made uh, the specific point that not only do we have to know that it formed, but it had to have been preserved, and it can't have been destroyed geologically over time, and then it can't have been destroyed by all the radiation that gets to the surface of Mars, because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field to protect its life, like we do here on Earth. 
And so after billions and billions of years of these rocks sitting on Mars, how do we go and then find one right at the surface where we can investigate and find something that tells us that, yeah, life could have existed here? That's the tiny little needle in the haystack that we're trying to find. And we haven't yet found life on Mars or evidence for former life, but what we've found are clays that were deposited in a wet environment that was not acidic. See, previously, other missions like um, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, um, the, the Opportunity rover is still going on Mars. They've found evidence for lots and lots of water, but it has never been in a neutral environment like this before. It's always been acidic or very extremely hot, and it's possible to find microbes in those environments. We do find them here on Earth, but life tends to thrive even more in neutral environments. So if you were to go to the bottom of any lake on Earth, the sediments that form at the bottom of that lake and then later turn into rock and get preserved in the rock record, that's the kind of material that we've now located on Mars. Uh, I do have one graphic that just summarizes all that for you. So there were two instruments. There, there are ten really big instruments on this wonderful, wonderful rover on Mars. And these two, the SAM, the Sample Analysis at Mars, and Chemin, the Chemistry and Mineralogy X-ray Diffraction um, uh, instruments, these are the two that have found this evidence. And over on the right is one of those rocks that we think shows uh, um, evidence for this water. So that rock was laid down in water. After it turned into a rock, water seeped into that stone again and formed some little nodules there. And then later that rock broke a little bit and water seeped in again and formed some veins. And so there's a long history of water coming and going and coming and going on Mars. So this is pretty exciting. All right. So, Cynthia, is Mars it as far as uh, exolife or are there any other places that might be interesting? Well, so as someone who's a fan of the outer solar system, when uh, Lori talks about what talks about potential water, potential life on Mars, it's very exciting. But that's all old, dead, <laughs> fossilized life. Europa is a small moon of Jupiter. It's about the same size as Earth's moon. And what's cool about Europa is that we are almost positive that there's a giant ocean of water on Europa now, today. So we're not talking about some old dried out fossilized you know, dirt and clays like on Mars. We're talking about a giant ocean. We're talking about something very similar to what Dale just showed us actually. Um, a thick ice layer at the surface, but under that there's this giant ocean of liquid water. And we know that it's probably similar to seawater here on Earth. Um, so it's, it's water. It's true water. And we know that that water's there now, and we want to explore it. So the fact that there is all of this water so far away from the sun makes it perhaps, I think, the best environment for life that exists there now. So not, not life sometime in the past, but life that could be there now today. And we have a lot of evidence from the Galileo spacecraft that was out at the Jupiter system in the um, mid to late 1990s, um, up until about 2003. Uh, was the last data we received from that spacecraft that gave us great evidence for this ocean of water. And it's more water than, than all of Earth's oceans combined. So we're talking about a lot of water. So we have some great evidence that that water is there. We know that there's a layer of ice at the surface that's probably between 5 and 10 kilometers thick, maybe more, maybe less in different places. Um, and so it's difficult to get under that ice down to the water layer. So we've talked about a next mission out there, and that's really what we need. The problem with the outer solar system is that we don't have the luxury of all of these Mars missions. You know, it seems like every year we're sending a new Mars mission, but no. with Europa, okay, okay, every year and a half, sorry. But, but with Europa missions, we've been waiting for more data since 2003, um, since the end of the Galileo mission. There's a new mission that's been proposed that's been at the top of NASA's list of the next high priority big mission to the outer solar system, and this mission is supposed to be to, to, this mission is supposed to be to Europa, and we've been working on developing this mission. We have a great mission concept, and we just need to get it funded. We need to get it through the last final levels of approval, and of course, in these times of budget difficulties in the federal government, it's hard to think about oh, here's a spare two billion dollars for a Europa mission, but. A mission like this would really ensure the next generation of scientists and the next generation of scientific discoveries in the outer solar system. And so we've launched recently a new website called Destination Europa. Um, and here's the, the here's a banner just describing it. 
and, and um, as well as the actual script, as well as the actual web page. So Destination Europa is at europa.seti.org, and here's what the homepage of that site looks like. This is a site to share our excitement about Europa. So it helps you understand why Europa is what we think the, the, the best place in the solar system beyond the Earth to look for life, extant life, so life that lives there today. And it also describes uh, what this potential Europa mission would be like, and it gives you some ways to get involved, so some ways to help, to help us spread the word about how exciting Europa mission would be. So go, go to this website and check it out. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay, Fran. Planets to moons, where else should we be looking for life? Well, I'm the lucky one here. <laughs> because, um, in fact, there is one Earth, there is one Mars, there is one Europa, <laughs> but we know now there is billions and billions of, of uh, exoplanets, planets in orbit around other stars. So how do we know that? Well, we know that thanks to Kepler. Let me just go back to the, to the Drake equation, which is here. Remember that... Um, most of you, when you start working at SETI Institute, you have this interview with Frank Drake, and he most likely asks you, so how are you going to help us, the SETI Institute, to refine these parameters? And I remember that what I told him is that basically what we like to work in the future is to work on the number of planets which have uh, uh, number of stars which have um, an, uh, a, st a planet in the habitable zone, the famous NE. Uh, parameter here. Well, it's starting now. Uh, as I say, Kepler has been working in s uh, over the past three years, observing the same area of the s of the sky. And now, what Kepler told us is that there is a lot of exoplanet in our galaxy. That's the famous parameter uh, uh, FP here. So, what we want to do at the SETI Institute, and that's what I'm working on right now specifically is to search this exoplanet to image them and to also extract a spectra. So why is this important? Well, so exoplanets have been detected by transit or radial velocity mostly. This gives us an idea of the size or the mass of the planet. What we want to do is to image the planet itself, so see the light coming from the planet. When you see the light of a planet, if you, if you diffract the light, if you analyze the light, you will also know the composition and the temperature of the, of the planet. So for this, we, have build, we are now building an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager, called GPI as well. So the Gemini Planet Imager started, it's a project that we started more than five years ago, and it's currently being integrated, meaning that we are mounted the instrument at UC Santa Cruz, and it will be shipped in the future, in uh, October, uh, August most likely, in Chile, at the Gemini South Telescope. So this is an instrument specifically built to image exoplanet. Could you show the website? Um, mm -hmm. So this web, there is a website that we uh, in, started a few months ago called planetimager.org, uh, planet which describes the instrument. Could you click on the video on the right, the gray, I, the gray uh, image, please? Yes. So this is a simulation. The instrument is not finished yet. It's not yet at the telescope in Chile. But this is a simulation. We show, we show you what we're going to see in the future. So we occulted the light of the star using a coronagraph. So you don't see the star itself. What you see at 7 o'clock on this image, it's basically the signal of a, an exoplanet. And the reason for which the exoplanet disappear during the observation is because we are scanning through the, wavelength, the near infrared wavelength range, meaning that we are looking at different color in the, in the spectra. And the planet disappears in this simulation simply because we assume that this planet has a composition of the atmosphere mostly uh, saturated with methane. So it disappears in the methane band. On the top, at uh, 12 o'clock, you see a background star, in fact. So using this instrument, we are, hoping to, we are hoping to observe, to detect this exoplanet, and we are hoping also to have direct information on this, on this exoplanet, such as the composition and the temperature. Well, that's really exciting. Um, and this will be on the air when? September 2012 should arrive in Chile. Uh, 2013, sorry. <laughs> and, oh, we no, can travel back in time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, city, we can do everything, right? <laughs> and most likely, with first light, scientific first light will be at the end of 2013. Well, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um,
I'm looking for questions from our audience, uh, but until we get uh, to leak and show me some, um, let me start with questions of my own. Dale, um, you're looking for life. You found life below the ice of um, permanently frozen lakes, uh, but there have been some claims in the past few months about two other lakes, Lake Vostok and Lake Willems, uh, where uh, teams from Russia and uh, from, I think it's the UK, have drilled into these sealed off environments and there have been claims about microbes or life and maybe related to life that we know or maybe some alien life, uh, new kinds of life. Can you shed any light on what the reality of the situation is? Yeah, a little bit. So the two teams that were working, one was actually a U.S. team, that was the uh, Willems team. Uh, John Priskew at Montana State University will be looking at the microorganisms there. They definitely found life in, in that lake. And, and these lakes are much different than the lakes that I look at. These are subglacial lakes. So these lakes are under um, kilometers of ice versus you know, meters of ice that I look at. So there's a huge difference there. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. And... Uh, and so that's key. There's very thick ice, there's no light, um, and, and uh, these lakes are much more sealed than the lakes that I'm working in, even though, although the lake that I'm currently working in, Lake Huntressee, is pretty sealed. So Lake Willems is under about 800 meters of ice, and it's in a drainage network over near the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And it's um, got a, a quicker turnover time so that the water that's in that system doesn't stay around so long. Uh, but when they drilled down to the bottom, they took samples, they've got core samples, they've got sediment, they actually looked at the material under the microscopes with some live dead stain and things like that uh, just after they retrieved it. And they definitely have uh, living cells there. And that's to be expected. Um, any place that we find water like this, we should probably find microorganisms, you know, unless there's some really, really extreme environment that's just... Like keeps... Europa. <laughs> well, we don't know. On the surface of Europa, perhaps. But, you know, what's going on in the water column, we don't know. Um, yeah. But uh, the, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that all the life that we find in these lakes is earth life. You know, we're all the same. All the life that we see on earth is earth life. We have, we're all rooted back to that same universal ancestor. So we use the same genetic code. Um, you know, other, some organisms have discovered some new physiological tricks to let them play in the environments that they're in, but we're all rooted in that same tree of life. Now, at Lake Vostok, um, that's still a story that's being um, unwound a little bit. You know, they, they drilled down into the lake um, two years ago allowed that water to flow up into the hole, it froze, and now they've come back this last season, they've re-drilled back down into the ice, have collected that ice, and that's on a ship coming back to, uh, uh, um, to Russia right now. Now, in that first set of samples that they brought back from the first drilling attempt, uh, they did bring back some fairly contaminated samples, and they've looked at those recently, and that's what sparked some of the... Uh, um, information that's been coming out of out of uh, uh, the Institute there and their initial look was that they found a lot of contaminants but they also have been looking at it this genetically and as as usual you know when you have such a small amount of material to work with uh, they didn't find on the on the charts a real common um, linkage to some of the organisms that we would typically see uh, so so they haven't really discovered new life they just don't know what they've discovered yet um, in, in the sense of the new microorganisms that might be present. You know, that's going to yeah, take... Well, that's, that's, a, that's a story that we need to continue to follow. Um, right. We have a question from um, Anthony Libra, who says, okay, so what's the most suitable action to take upon discovery of an extraterrestrial life form? Should we risk taking it back to Earth? Does anybody want to tackle that one? Well, in... Uh, uh, 2010 by Arthur C. Clarke, there's the famous quote, all these worlds are yours except Europa, attempt no landings there. Um, and so people have actually been a bit concerned about whether we should leave Europa for the Europans and, and, and leave it alone. And, you know, all, all science fiction jesting aside, actually Arthur C. Clarke did give NASA permission to land on Europa, so we don't have to worry about that prohibition anymore. Um, but there are planetary protection concerns, and especially in a place like Europa, where there could be possibly living microorganisms, I think we have to be very, very careful not to destroy them in the act of detecting them. And so while it's really exciting to think about going and landing on Europa, 
The problem is that most of these landed missions would probably have a, a nuclear power source. And so the last thing we want to do is land on the surface, melt down our way into the ocean, finally get into the ocean, and then contaminate and poison that ocean. Just, you know, just in the moment that we detect these microorganisms, we kill them all off. That would be horrible. So I think that there are ways to do this carefully, such as the Lake Vostok drilling, but I think that we need to have a, a calm, measured approach. And that's why this next Europa mission is actually not even going to land on the surface. It'll be a, a dedicated um, mission that orbits either around Europa or around Jupiter with, with close flybys. But we're not ready to land yet. So when you say we're not ready to land, that means the next step is to have, first step is to map the surface of Europa, identify the place where the ice is thinner maybe, I'm going to assume. Yeah. And then the next step is to land something on the surface and dig into it and go underneath a submarine. That's that. That's you know still in the a submarine under the surface of Europa. It's still kind of in the realms of science fiction. But yeah, that's what that that's what kind of the future mission plan would be. Maybe the first mission would just dig. You know, kind of like the rovers on Mars have done. It'll dig somewhat into the subsurface in an area that we think might have material that was brought up from the ocean. Uh, it might dig down and examine that material. Um, but yeah, it'll depend on if we can find a place where the, where the ice is locally thin enough to make it feasible to, to drill or to melt our way down into it, then yeah, that's eventually what we're going to want to do. OK, um, this is still going to be in your court, Cynthia. Uh, Richard Larson's asking us about Europa. And maybe he's uh, suggesting that might be old hat or, or uh, maybe not the best choice. He says, Enceladus has been shown to have organics and an outlet mechanism to actually measure what's inside the moon through, pro through the proxy of what's leaking out. Uh, what makes you think Europa is a better candidate than Enceladus? Yeah, so, so you're, you're opening a good can of worms here. There's, there, there's in the outer, the outer solar system community, there's kind of the Enceladus groupies and there's the Europa groupies. And so and clearly you can... Don't forget the Titans. Oh yeah, and Titan. Well, you know, Titan doesn't. Titans. Titan's just a mess. Okay, so we won't talk about Titan. But so the difference between Enceladus and Europa is Europa is a pretty big moon as moons go. It's about as big as Earth's moon. So we think that if there's an ocean, and again, we're pretty sure, although we haven't actually gone there and swum in it, so we're not positive that ocean is there, but we're pretty sure there's an ocean. And that ocean has probably been there throughout the whole geologic history of Europa. So we're talking about four billion years of a nice, clement, um, a, just a great, stable environment for life. Europe, I mean, Enceladus is this little tiny moon of Saturn. I mean, it's really small. And it's crazy that it's venting, that it has these jets, these geysers of material that it's venting for near the South Pole. And so, yeah, it's very exciting. And the possibility of flying through these jets and collecting samples, it's a great way. I mean, it's basically, it's like a free sample. It's throwing them up at us saying, you know, cash, take the sample. But the thing about Enceladus is that because it's so small, and also because this geyser activity is so energetic, there's no way that it could have sustained this throughout geologic time. So we're looking at sort of a special time in Enceladus. The reason we know that is just that if these geysers had been going on throughout the whole history of the Saturn system, Enceladus would be gone. It would have vented all of its material and we just have a ring there. And in fact, Enceladus does orbit Saturn within this ring of diffuse material that's jetted off of itself. But so we know because of that that there's no way that this activity has been going on for four billion years. Also, we know that probably the reservoir of material that materials that this, that these jets come from, it's probably not a nice big global interconnected ocean. We're probably talking about localized kind of pockets of material. So yeah, well, I will definitely agree that Enceladus is a really fascinating place to look at in terms of a nice stable environment for life to form and evolve and thrive. I'm still in the Europa camp. Okay, so Laurie, I want to I want to bring it back to Mars. Um, you know, Cynthia said to you, uh, "Well, old dead fossil stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Not interesting." Um, is that true? I mean, is it real? Have we ruled out the possibility that there can be any extant life on Mars? Well, you never rule out a possibility of life. That's something I've learned. If you just ask Dale about that, <laughs> you never rule it out. I guess the real question is, do we see signs of liquid water flowing on the surface of Mars now? We know that it happened billions of years ago. Uh, there's lots of evidence for that. Um, it's possible that it's going on on Mars now. We, we think that in small areas like um, the northern polar dunes seem to show some springtime flow that 
looks for all the world like melting water, and it makes sense that there's water ice there that melts at that time of year. There are some other features that have been seen to change. Some We don't know if they're dry landslides or if there's water flowing down, but in the springtime, there are these dark lines that flow in these little gullies, and they happen every year, and they're different, and they change from one week to another. We can see that they're going downhill, so is that water? Is it dry? We don't, we don't know, but it's possible, it's always possible, that if life formed billions of years ago, it can be quite hardy and it somehow learned to survive. It's also possible that there's life in the subsurface somewhere where there's a lot more water than we see at the surface. So you, you never rule it out. You never do. I, I'd say, you know, there, there's a, a friendly competition between the Mars people and the outer solar system. <laughs> yeah. And we got both here. <laughs> you know, we're we're really blessed really to have them all. I support a mission to Europa. I would like to see us go back to Titan. I would like to see, There are so many worlds out there that could harbor life. And if we find it on any world, I don't care where it is, anything beyond Earth, it's, it's mind blowing. So, okay. So, Frank, for your Gemini planet imager, you're going to be able to hopefully image an exoplanet, are you going to be able to do any spectroscopic analysis? Are you going to be able to know anything about its atmosphere and potential influence on that atmosphere from a biosphere? So Gemini will be capable, Gemini planet imager will be capable of doing spectroscopy, low resolution spectroscopy. So that's, it means that we will know the temperature of the exoplanet, we will know roughly the composition of the clouds on the surface, and we may be able to also see variability. Something I did not mention is that Gemini Planet Major will image exo uh, Jupiter, Jupiter sized planet, and young Jupiter sized planet, not the old one, like the 30 million years old exoplanet. Why this? Well, simply because when the planet is young, it's also hot, so it's easier to detect. But GPA is the first step. There is another step, of course. It is the idea of building a larger telescope, a 30 meter, 40 meter plus telescope. And this is currently in progress. The European uh, uh, started the construction of the EELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope. And there is two other competition, competitive projects. One is a 30 meter telescope in Hawaii, and one is the giant cement Magellan telescope in, in Chile as well. These telescopes will have a bigger aperture, and with this kind of a telescope, will be capable of detecting smaller exoplanets, okay. and also do spectroscopy on these smaller exoplanets to detect emission line, which could be indication of life, or at least biosignatures, such as ozone, methane, uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide, and so on. Okay. But that's a while in the future yet. Uh, we're talking about 2020-ish. Not that far away. Not so far. Not so far for answering a really important question. Okay, so I'd like to wrap this hang up, hang out up with um, one question I'll throw out, and anybody can try and answer this. Um, is there any place on Earth that we can actually be sure is devoid of life? Or is it just that places we've looked that seem to be sterile? Um, it may just be the fact that our instruments aren't sensitive enough to find life that's there. Or could it be weird life that's there, or a shadow biosphere? What about our planet? Into the lab. Jill, I think. Go ahead. I just wanted to kick in. I think it's important that you understand that there's lots of places on Earth that there's no life. I mean, there's many, many places that there's no life. I mean, just go in and into a a place where you've got a sterilizer and there's no life where you're sterilizing that environment. So it's it's where those conditions are conducive for life that we do find life. So when we have places on earth with where the opportunity for life can can take hold, um, we will find life. Uh, but it's only in those those areas where um, life just can't make it and that's that's where we're starting to whittle down you know where's the bag of tricks quit and that's that's the fine line that we're working towards. Okay, so let me poke you on that a bit. Uh, a few years ago, the National Academy put out a report on weird life, uh, life that is not related to our last common ancestor, life that potentially uses different biosolvents, has a different metabolism, isn't in fact likely to be found with the techniques and the instruments that we use to find life as we know it. 
is this nonsense? Um, could What's that up? life be thriving in these environments where you say conditions aren't conducive to life as we do know it? Right. It, it, it's, it's, it's easy to conceive that there could be pockets someplace on the planet where we have an additional life form that's, that's completely independent of uh, you know, the original origins of our own life um, that we've rooted to. Um, I think competition probably would have done, uh, made it very difficult for those organisms to survive over the geologic time scales that we're, we're talking. That said, you know, maybe there's places that we just haven't looked yet that we don't understand well enough, um, and maybe in the future we'll, we'll discover some new niches and have different instrumentation that, that lets us peer into those places. But I have to admit, I have a hard time imagining those. Now, back to the weird life, you know, that was really to help explain, you know, how could we understand how life could have... Um, uh, flourished on a place like Titan, um, you know, which is so radically different than than what we've got here on Earth. You know, where we've got temperatures now that are that are you know hundreds of degrees below zero, and where you have organic compound or organic solutions, you know, that are, you know liquid methane and liquid hydrocarbons that are the uh, the solvents, you know, and, and using ammonia. So that's where people have been trying to understand how could you get the energy sources in uh, to let metabolite um, met, met, um, metabolism take place and uh, allow organisms to, to flourish. And it's, it's, it's really really pushing our imagination scientifically even uh, to, to understand those kinds of ecosystems that could have worked there. So there is other groups which are looking for what we call shadow biosphere. That's what you have in mind, I think. Yeah. Um, well, we had this famous paper on the arsenic life, which was basically the idea that there is a niche somewhere uh, on our own planet where life adapts and can differentiate to the, to the normal tree of life that we have in here. But in, now we know that the arsenic life, but well, we're almost certain that the arsenic life was not, in fact, an arsenic life. But people are looking for life in extreme environment. Like uh, this book here, and when we think about this, there is this idea of looking for life close to volcanoes. There is an extremely hot temperature, and see what kind of organism can survive in not in lava, but almost very close to the lava, and use the energy of the volcano. And for the moment, nothing has been published, but that's an extreme life which could be interesting for us exoplanetary scientists, because we have a lot of those exoplanets close to the star, so the temperature on the surface of this exoplanet is similar to the temperature of close to a volcano. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, guys. It's time to, to end this all. I could go on talking with, with all of you for a long, long time. I think there are questions from the audience that are unanswered. We'll try and get some answers posted to those. Um, the work that uh, this highlights the, the Communicate campaign that we've begun here at the SETI Institute, um, I think it's showcased at least for me, and I, I certainly hope for you, some of the really exciting uh, parts of the research we do here. And we'd love you all to continue to be part of these Hangouts and to participate in the discussion in the future. Um, each of you can help uh, to participate in the research by, by joining our SETI STARS program. Um, this, unfortunately, uh, we all love what we do, but it doesn't come for free. And we would love to have your support. You can follow us on Google Plus and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and uh, this weekend, we just opened a Twitter account in Spanish for those that follow us from uh, South America and Spain. So come on back. Keep an eye on Hangouts to come up in the future. Um, join us again and visit our website. Learn some more about the work we do here, which I find wonderfully fascinating. Terrific to have colleagues such as the four we had here today. And thank you all thank for you. participating. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks. thanks.